Hello, hello, hello. I am so glad that you all are joining me today. You are in store for a great, great hour. So I'm going to ask you to sit back and relax and have an essential chat with Mitt and the people that will be joining me today. Let me kind of tell you when I get started with a project, I always play music. And the song that resonated with me today was The Golden Day. And I'm gonna tell you, read some of the lyrics to you. People, let me tell you, there's a time in your life when you find out who you are. That's the golden time of day. In your mind, you'll find you're a bright shining star. Oh, that's the golden time of day. So when you fall deep inside all the love you've been looking for, don't it make you feel okay? That's the time of the day when the sun is going down. That's the golden time of day. That is by Frankie Beverly and Mays. I live here outside of Philadelphia and Frankie Beverly is on our airways all the time. Now, why did I just read that to you? Well, when I became president of NASW, one of my dreams was that I would go across the country, meet with various chapters, but also go to the middle schools and to the high schools and talk about social work and get people excited about a, pre a, a profession that is focused on the strengths of people. And COVID hit, so I've been on numerous Zoom calls. And then one day I sat talking with our communications director, Greg Wright, and Angelo McLean, our CEO, and we decided, well, since I can't get out to all of your communities, I will come to you. And so that's what we're doing. So today launches the first chat, essential chat with Mitt. I hope that what you will do is put in other chats that you would like to see. And we're going to talk with social workers. The rules that we have is that I believe that a social worker should never talk about changing anything unless they talk with the people who've been affected. So you will see throughout all my chats, really talking with a person or people or system that is in fact the one that has been most affected. So today we're gonna to focus on foster care. And the reason I'm focusing on foster care was because when I graduated uh, from Howard University School of Social Work, I started working in a child welfare agency. At first I worked in, prior to going to Howard, I worked in the protective service unit. And then I came back and I was elevated to become the chairperson of the child abuse unit. It was just when the child abuse law became effective here in Pennsylvania. And I would go out and I would train people on child abuse techniques. So I became the legal liaison for the agency. I went to the judge when we needed to get an emergency order. I worked with kids and their families. But one thing that I learned throughout social work programs is that every family has strengths. And even though some of their darkest days are when their child needs to come into care, there's still strength in family. What I also learned about the system of child welfare, that it seemed to be more, more bureaucratic than I thought it would be. It was more about following the rules and all of the legislation of keeping kids in foster care. Sometimes kids were struggling in care. They had this crazy thing called the honeymoon period. And the honeymoon period was actually, well, a child that you bring into care can't see their parents right away. We want them to feel more comfortable with their foster parents. I thought that was a bizarre, crazy rule. So I worked at the agency on my on the mezzo level and got that rule changed. But what I also knew is that I was working in a broken system. I was working in a system that were bringing kids in care 
And they didn't really work on behalf of the families and children. So today I thought my first chat should be about something that I think needs to be changed. Should be about something that I'm gonna ask you today. I'm gonna to ask you today to think about what is the change that you can implement tomorrow in order to change the facts that I'm going to read to you in a minute. Whether you work on the micro level with working with just an individual, working with a child, working with the family, whether you're the foster parent, whatever, whether you just are working with someone who came into care, what can you do to make that difference? Or if you are a supervisor or a department head and you're on that mezzo level, what rules do you have that need to be ripped up and made sure that we work on behalf of children and families? And if you're on the mic macro level and you're gonna meet somebody who's dynamic that's on that level, what are you doing about changing policy? So with all of that, I'm gonna ask you to think about all of those things to when, when, when Steve Pemerton and Jessica Price are gonna to speak to you, to put down your pens and put down adding things to the chat room and listen. Listen and think, what will I do? Because if we work together collectively as social workers, all 700,000 of us, we can bring change to the system. We can reimagine the world that children come and rely on us, are able to tell us their truths. We're families who are struggling can come to us and know that our first instinct is not gonna be to yank their child away from them, but to bring support and do whatever we need to do within that community to bring them peace of mind. So many of Americans' child welfare systems are badly broken and children can suffer serious harm as a result. Some will be separated from their siblings Others will be bounced from one foster care placement to another, never knowing when their lives will be uprooted next. Too many will be further abused in the system that was to protect them. And some of them will never ever reunify with their families. Let me give you some stats. One, any given day in these United States, there are nearly 424,000 children in foster care. In 2019, over 672,000 children spent time in the foster care system. On average, children remain in state care for over a year and a half. And 5% of those children will languish in that system for over five or more years. Despite the common perception that children come in very early, the average age that kids enter is eight years old. In 2019, one third of children entering foster care were young people of color. One third were young people of color. While most children in foster care lived in family settings, remember that 10% of them were sent to institutions or group homes because there were no homes for them. In 2019, over more than 71,000 children whose mother and father's rights had been legally terminated were still waiting to be adopted. And in 2019, more than 17,000 young people aged out of foster care without a permanent family, without that permanent support to be able to help them through their teenage and early years. And we do know that research tells us that without being linked 
to a family system, many of those children experience homelessness, unemployment, become incarcerated as adults. So while the states work permanently to find permanent home for kids, many never get that opportunity. So that is what I'm asking you to think about today. Those statistics. And not to say, wow, what are they going to do? My father used to say, when you point a finger out, three fingers are pointing back to yourself. What are you going to do to reimagine a system that works on behalf of families, children, and youth? So without further ado, I want to tell you how things are going to run today. I'm going to introduce to you the most two dynamic people I know. And then we will come back together, all three of us, and we'll have questions and you'll get to ask your questions as well. But I want you to really listen when they speak and to think about what can I do or what can my agency do or what does my state need to do? We have a system of children who need us to step up and get into some good trouble. So I'm going to introduce to you first a person that I met a long time ago, and his name is Steve Pemberton. And you know, the one thing that resonates about Steve, he has never forgotten how to bend that arc of justice towards equity for all. He has worked on behalf for equality, access, and opportunity, both not only in his professional life, but his personal life. I met Steve in 2014 when he spoke at an NASW conference and he talked to us about a chance in the world. It's a story of his life, a story that, that it was a hard life when you really listen to his full presentation. But yet, he didn't let that stop him. He hurtled. He realized that it was within himself to bring about change. And so I want you to meet the chief people officer for Work Human. And that gives recognition to people because that's who Steve is. No matter where Steve is, what he does, and I have to tell you this little story before I turn the stage just to Steve, it's that I was doing a, a program up on the vineyard, and we, we're kind of Facebook friends, and I said, well, I want to bring some social workers to the vineyard to really kind of talk about how are we going to bring change to these systems, not how is other people going to do it, what are we going to commit to do? So I wrote, looking for I got this little message, I'll help you in any way that I can. And he did. And he came to the vineyard. He was our highlight. But he let every social worker know what they could do to change this system. So I'm going to introduce to you, Steve, and then another person will be Dr. Jessica Price, who heads up the Florida Institute on Child Welfare. And in fact, this morning, she was testifying on behalf of children, family, and youth. She's a HU graduate, you know HU, you know. Um, you know that we always work that strengths perspective. And you're gonna hear Jessica talk about what she has done at the Florida Institute for Child Welfare. So I am not gonna spend one more second. I'm gonna go off screen because I want this screen to be filled up with my friend, Steve Pemberton. Steve, thank you, and it's yours. Uh, thank you, Mitt. That was incredibly kind and, and gracious. Uh, you know, uh, I was starting to blush there a little bit and actually may have forgotten who you were talking about there for a second. Thinking, you know, I kind of want to hear from, from this person uh, my, myself. Uh, I'm sure we all have people in our life uh, like uh, I, I have with Mitt where, you know, she calls and uh, you don't even really know what she's asking you to do but she has such authenticity, such passion, and such sincerity that uh, you have no, no choice but, but to say yes. So uh, that's what brought me you know, to the vineyard. Um, 
a couple summers ago now, and uh, what brings me, you know, here to talk with you uh, today. I don't have a, a, a lot of time, but I, I should tell you uh, that, you know, my own journey, you know, through foster care uh, was a turbulent one. Uh, growing up in Massachusetts, no memory really of family. I didn't know where I'd come from, who I belonged to, and I, yet I find myself in, in these homes that really see me as uh, as a source of income. And and to be honest, I, I lose my entire childhood uh, because of, in essence, having, you know, fallen through the system. And it was a well-intended system, but it also, as you well know, is also a very burdened one too. And had there been different training, uh, I think, for, for my social workers, had they been able to kind of see really not the circumstances of my life, but its, but its possibilities, despite everything that was happening in that present moment, then maybe the arc of it all would have been different. And that's one of the first things that I uh, would ask of us all, actually, and was getting at Mitt's core question here, what is it that you can do uh, that's you know within your power? Because I know certainly there's always resource battles and constraints and policy discussions and all of that. Um, and those fights are necessary to have. Uh, but there's this other impact and ability that we can have too. And one of them is to see the child, uh, not through the circumstances of their life, but rather through their possibilities. Because the circumstances were not of their doing. They did not create the circumstance. Uh, and, and yet they have this incredible possibility in front of them too. And the possibility comes from the strength that one gathers as a result of having to navigate a lot of different environments. And so speaking, I think always, um, speaking uh, to, to any young person through that lens of possibility is so incredibly powerful. I think part of that power is also pivoting too, um, because on the one hand, yes, we're focused on the day-to-day -day care and situation, what's optimal and what's best. Uh, but there's also this longer term view uh, about what your life can be. And so what are the things that get you there? Certainly a safe and secure home does, yes. A educational experience, uh, which was so essential and so important, you know, to, to me. Uh, and early on, I stumbled on to a love of reading. Nobody told me to. Uh, I can't say with the exception of a kind neighbor anyone really fostered that in me. It wasn't the nature of the homes that I grew up in. But but because I read as much as I did, I see I could escape to a different world where I wasn't judged. Um, and uh, there was no need to kind of label me or categorize me. Of course, it provided me a lot more. It provided me vision, which is the next thing I, I, uh, I, I want to suggest to us, uh, to arm that child with a different vision than the one that perhaps they've come into the world with. You know, my vision uh, that had really been defined, uh, you know, for me was uh, you don't have a chance in the world. It came from the diary entry uh, of a babysitter who said, you know, what he's been born into is too difficult. He can't overcome this. He doesn't have a chance in the world. Well, because of how much I read, I did wind up with a chance in the world. So even that phrase to me, means something different than it does to most people. Because when you hear a chance in the world, a lot of times you hear something doesn't have a chance. There's no possibility. I look at it the exact opposite way. Maybe all we need, any of us really, is a chance. That if we just have that chance, just that one chance, then the arc of all this can be different. And so what is that chance? What does it look like? How does it sound? How does it feel? How does it move? Uh, and your answer to that question is in the mirror. It's you. You're the chance, actually. You're the chance. Children are too young to articulate what your presence in their life means, how much they're looking forward to the next time you come visit, how they're relying on your genuine spirit, your goodness, your kindness. And you're, you're kind of counting down the days so you're going to see your social worker again. Uh, that's how I saw it. And each time I was hoping that, you know, my, my social workers would see that I was a lot more than this kid who uh, had been written off, in all honesty, by, by society. So giving children vision matters. It's very important, actually. And the vision isn't just about 
you know, what, where you are is also where your life can go. And in part because of the strengths, the messages, the words we use about your strengths, your capabilities, your possibilities. The next thing I'd say is really uh, about this kind of generational impact. I did not know this at the time, but I really have been born into a generational cycle. Uh, you know, I, uh, I lost my mother at, at the age of 40. Uh, my grandmother passed away at the age of 40. Uh, my uh, father was orphaned. My grandfather was orphaned, as was I. I mean, this was a generational cycle that, that, that had unfolded. And, and yet the arc of it, again, changes uh, because of these everyday kindnesses, these people who showed up in my life at just the right time, uh, who even at the time, they weren't really aware how much I was hanging on to their goodness, to their kindness, to the impact that they were having on me. And because of them, well, the story gets rewritten. You know, this multi-generational story of loss and suffering, it ends, it ends. And it ends actually with me. Uh, I am happily married to my wife, Tanya, for the last uh, 24 years. We're the proud parents of three children, uh, Quinn and Vaughn and Kennedy. Uh, Quinn, uh, you can actually see them here over, over, over this shoulder. Uh, much younger photo, by the way. The boys are significantly taller than me now. Uh, at uh, Not significantly, actually, but they are taller, which they want to make sure that you know. Um, and then daddy's girl, Kennedy, who is uh, going to be 16 next month. The boys are 20 and 18. And, you know, at the time uh, that I was, uh, you know, their age and younger, no one ever thought that this story could be rewritten, that there's not a chance in the world prediction uh, was going to do anything other than add yet another chapter. And there's some things that those folks miss, and I can see in my case file, uh, I can see the things they missed. They missed. They missed my own desire, certainly, to better uh, my life and, and circumstance. Um, and they also missed. They also missed you. Actually, that's what they really missed. They they just could not anticipate the number of people with a quiet word, a kind nudge, uh, gave me this affirmation of hope, which is absolutely what you represent. I do know that. Uh, given so much of what you see can be a challenge. I mean, I, I, I know that um, you see some of the most difficult situations, uh, you know, that one can possibly imagine. Anything that involves, uh, you know, a, a child in a turbulent situation of time of uncertainty or even abuse, it sits on our soul. Uh, it goes home with us. We talk to our spouses and our family about it. And I think it's always important to protect your spirit, too, because the children who are counting on you actually need your spirit to be protected so that you can always fully see them and be their, their advocate. And then my last word, because uh, I think we turn it over to Dr. Price, um, and actually is a great Greek uh, uh, proverb, you know, that says a society grows great when the elders of that society plant trees in whose shade they know they will never sit. And that's literally the definition of what a social worker really does. We're not always there to see the, the full impact uh, that we have on the life of a child, but those seeds that we plant in, in them about their, their possibilities and not their circumstances and their vision and their strength uh, with your own, you know, protection and support of, of one another, you know, those seeds do become trees and those trees bend the arc of lives and, and, and generations. So I hope that you'll continue doing the work that, that you do. A lot of my motivation in writing uh, my book um, uh, called actually A Chance in the World that became a movie as well. Uh, was because I was trying to get a message across to you about how important you are and how you know, children like me, as we grow and move on and write new chapters, we never, ever forget you. We never forget your advocacy. We never forget your support. We never forget your kindness. We never forget your smile and the way that you look at us. Uh, that stays with us. We tell our families. We tell our children, as I tell my children, about those who came along. And that's how in many ways we're remembered. And isn't that something special? That, that is quite a gift.
So I'm going to remain on because you're going to hear from Dr. Price here uh, in, in, in just a little bit. Oh, folks want me to repeat the proverb. Uh, and again, again, it comes from the Greeks. And it says that a society grows great when the elders of that society plant trees in whose shade they know they will never sit. It means we don't always get to see how it turns out. But isn't that faith, though? Right? Isn't that the essence of faith, that we take the step and we have faith that it will turn out, well, it'll turn out just okay? It certainly has for me. Man, I think you're on mute. Thanks, Steve. You you always hit it out the park and always give us those words of wisdom. And we're going to get back to you and I are going to come back on after we hear from Dr. Jessica Price. So, Jessica, we're just going to segue right over to you because we know that you are working to help social workers understand how they have to reimagine themselves and what skills they need to have. And we talked about the micro, the macro, the mezzo. Uh, I did yell that, I mean, I let everybody know that you were talking to the legislators um, today and that you're, you, you, you do this work. It's not just writing about it. You do this work, but that's a HU graduate. We do the work, right? So Jessica, let's turn it over to you and we'll see you when you're done. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I wasn't on for the introductions, but I am Jessica Price, and I am an assistant professor at FSU and also the executive director of the Florida Institute for Child Welfare. Thank you to President Jorner for inviting me on her inaugural Essential Chats with MIT. I'm really excited to be here, and I think it's really fitting that I am sharing the panel with Mr. Steve Pemberton, so I want to acknowledge you as well and your um, amazing words and, and testimony that you just gave. Thank you. I read A Chance in the World a few years ago, and I also assigned it to my students. I was teaching at the time, and it was so inspiring, but it also disturbed me. And I think that after you read something like that, and I believe that was a part of your mission for writing it, it's our job to create a system that, that, that can't happen again, and hopefully that will not happen again. And that's the work I do. The work I do is reimagining, re-envisioning, transforming what child welfare is. So what I am about to talk about won't necessarily be a motivational speech, but you may feel motivated afterwards. It also won't be a traditional call to action, but you may be moved to action afterwards. My paramount goal today is to implore you to ask yourself, what are you willing to do today to revolutionize the foster care system? You know, how important is it for you to live in a country where your foster care system is safe and equitable, whether you are a social worker, an educator, a hospital ER physician, a mental health counselor, a juvenile justice probation officer, a civilian in the community? We need everyone on board to ask yourself, how important is it for us to build a system where again, what happened to Mr. Pemberton could never happen again? I want to talk about evolutionary change and revolutionary change. For 90 plus years, our system has evolved, right? We started with iterations of orphanages that didn't allow black kids to be a part of it. We moved to traditional foster homes and and we're trying to really reframe the term foster care to stranger care. The idea that we don't want to sever any relational sacred ties. We want to place kids with people who they know, but fully support that placement, right? So evolutionary change is just that, right? It, it, different iterations of policies that tweak our system to make it a little bit better but not profoundly different. And I agree, our system has changed over the years and improved and gotten a little bit better, but it's time to revolutionize what we do in child welfare. And I want you to ponder, what are you willing to do today to be a part of that revolution? Revolutionary change is profound and transformational. It's not a tweak, it's not slightly better, but it's profoundly different. We view families differently. We receive cases at our hotlines differently. We view inequity differently, no longer tolerating it, but ameliorating it. 
we look at power differently because we have power in this system to make decisions. But we no longer take that power and dictate what parents and kids will do. We now share that power and co-design a path forward. We also view differently prevention. Gone are the days for cookie cutter, equality driven service models. We focus on equity and justice, strengthening families and freeing them from oppressive systems. I read a quote a few, year, a few years ago and it said, people need more than rights to be free. They need power, autonomy and agency and the ability to make their own choices. They need resources and a social environment that provides holistic collaboration with the community so families are empowered and parents are equipped to care and take care of their own children. So again, we need more than rights to be free. I am talking about a community aspect, but I want social workers to know that you are the leaders. I'm a social worker. I consider myself a leader on this quest to the revolution. I have a few questions that I want to offer up. I wrote an op-ed a couple of weeks ago and it was called, I think the title turned out to be, we are overdue for a revolution. So these are questions that we put in the op-ed that I want social workers and community members to be thinking about before we separate a child from their family and place them in foster care. One of the questions, because we do that in theory because there's a danger threat. The first question I want you to ponder is what can we do to remove the danger instead of the child? What can we do to remove the danger instead of the child? The second question I want you to ponder is, can someone that the family knows move into the home to help mitigate the danger? Can someone the child and family knows move into the home to help remove or mitigate the danger? Number three, can the caregiver go live with a relative or fictive kin. And I'm gonna go right into number four, this is a quick, <laughs> thank you, Greg, for changing this, is how can we fully support as a system those kinship placements that we're so, so much working and advocating for? If we have resources and a wraparound services for a foster care placement, are we gonna do a reinvestment to do that if we place a child with mom, grandma, granddad, aunt, older sister, older brother? Ultimately, Ask this question, put your revolutionary hat on. Number five, what would it take to keep this family together? In a room with your colleagues and your supervisors and your deputies, what would it take to keep this family together? Another question that won't come up on the screen, but I, it's, it's, I've really taken it to heart. And people usually ask me, well, will there ever be a reason to take a child out of the home and place them in foster care? My answer is always going to be yes. There may be a reason where that is happening, but it's a small percentage. And if that has to happen, I implore you to ask the question, who already loves this child? Okay. Again, who already loves this child? We hear so many inspirational stories of teachers stepping up, like what Mr. Pemberton just said, social workers stepping up educators stepping in, neighbors stepping in and saying, I know this child, I love this child. Again, to mitigate and buffer them from the trauma of being taken away from everything familiar to them and placed in unfamiliar territory. As I close, it's kind of fitting. I, I promise you we didn't collaborate on our ending quotes. <laughs> Mr. Pemberton's quote about, you know, you know, planting a tree that you may not be able to get shade from. I have a Chinese proverb that I usually, you know, say when I get to talk. And it says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time is right now. So ask yourself, what are you willing to do right now to plant a tree for a brand new system, a different system for the people that are coming behind us? And when you answer that question, let's get to it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Wow. From the golden days from Frankie Beverly to all about trees, right? Planting a tree and not being here for the, the shade is a golden day. And planting a tree today is another golden day. So 
what we're going to do is, is we're going to take questions from you. So you can feel free to put questions in the chat and we will take some questions. But it, before we get started, I'm going to ask some questions of our panelists. But first, again, I'm going to say thank you. Um, I know you all do this of your time. If I had money in my pocket, I'd be throwing it out to you all. Because we're not talking about helping ourselves. Jessica is Dr. Jessica Price. The world is her oyster. Uh, she is going far. There's no question in my mind. And Steve Pemberton has a beautiful family behind him. And every day they love him. We're doing this because there's a child somewhere that needs us. There's a child somewhere that needs all of you that are listening. Um, and as, as Jessica said, you know, what are you willing to do to start that revolution in your agency, in even in with yourself? Uh, I know, as uh, Steve talked about, how difficult it is when you come home and you think about, wow, I just worked with. But I would always say to my workers, you can't turn it off. You can scale the elephant down, but you can't turn it off because when you turn it off, there's a kid who needs you. So Jessica, let me ask you this question. When you um, were in the classroom or even when you testify, I know you just came off of giving, um, letting some legislators know about policy. What are some of the policies that you're letting these legislators know about? Thank you, Mitt. Right now we're really trying to talk through you know, the Family First Prevention and Services Act. It was written into law about three years ago. And it is really pointed at preventing kids from going into, you know, foster care and, and elaborating and creating more avenues to have flexibility around mental health treatment and things of that nature. What we really want to do is make sure states or are creating operating procedures around that policy where we do get to some areas of inequity. So that we're not just, again, having that, like I said, when I said something earlier, equality driven procedures, but more equity driven procedures. As we're trying to keep kids out of foster care, how are we also being at the head of that around primary prevention? Mm -hmm. The second thing I want to note is, you know, legislators here in Florida, I'm excited to say they're, they're talking more about primary prevention. And they're talking about how do we build a prevention system as opposed to a child welfare system? How do we make sure that before parents even become be a part of our knowledge or come into our system, that they get the help that they need? Mm -hmm. So that those are kind of the two big things that we're working on here. Okay, thank you, Steve. You know, child welfare, uh, the system is was very painful for you. Uh, created and, and I read your book and created so much trauma. Um, you know, it, it it was hard. I read your book just I couldn't put it down. Because I, I, here I was, a child welfare worker, and I kept thinking, what is it that I'm doing wrong? Because I don't ever want this to happen to any of the kids that I work with. Um, and, and, and I remember, you know, taking kids from their home at night. And, you know, I'm going to say this. I remember not really turning around and saying to that child, you'll see your parents tomorrow. Don't worry. You know, you're so busy focusing on that getting that child into that care and, and making sure they're adjusted in their new foster home. You know, I did not force my kids to call their foster parents parents because I couldn't imagine how could I call my somebody else my mother and father. That's just that was impossible. But but what would you say to a caring worker who in the middle of the night picks up a child because the circumstances the child is not safe? What advice would you give to that worker to turn around and talk to that child about what's happening in their life? Uh, I lived, I lived exactly that, that experience, man. And, um, you know, for me, I never did see my mother again, actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think Dr. Price is getting at this as well. There's just some situations where it's not best for the child to remain with their biological family or their biological parent. That was absolutely the case for me. I mean, my mother was not well. Uh, and, and, you know, she wanted to be a mother, actually. It was the only thing anchoring her to the world. But she was incapable of taking care of herself, let alone 
her children. Uh, and, you know, she made a prediction that she would not be able to survive without us. And that prediction turned out actually, you know, to be true. I think, you know, when you're uprooted, my own, my very first memory is of the day I was taken from my mother, actually. And I didn't actually even know that was, uh, that that's what happened until later on when I was reading my case file and I, a social worker had detailed the day that I was taken from her a few days before Christmas. And I realized that this memory that I'd had for years, I'd retained it because that was the last time I'd ever see her, even though I had no memory of her. That's how traumatic it actually was. Uh, but I think assurance is the most important thing that a social worker can do in a moment like that, uh, because you don't have the capacity to understand that my mom is not well, my dad is not well. You don't have the language. You don't understand that. Uh, and so, but, but to let them know that you will be okay in that you have this other family, words matter, because you, you realize you are being pulled away from the only family you've known, but there's this other family that loves you too. And we're going to provide help and support for, for you to make sure that you are well. And depending on their age, that we can help mom and dad be well. You know, because those are the things that you try and hang on to, actually. The, the critical mistake that was made with me was they decided, born of good intention, we're not going to tell him anything. Mm -hmm. And so my, you know, I grow up this young African-American kid with uh, then a blonde Afro, uh, a Polish last name of Klakowicz and blue eyes. And I don't know what a Klakowicz is. I don't know. And I get all these questions um, and nobody's there to answer those questions for me. So my own identity is a mystery to me because there's nobody to tell me that they won't. And I'm curious. I want to know, but they won't tell me. The social work is really the only connection that you have to any semblance of what was once normal. The social work is it. Teachers, perhaps, but they don't really know because they're not day to day. They're not engaged and involved in, in, in cases. So that's what I would say insurance, assurance and, and protection matters. So I'm going to ask this question to both of you before we open up and get the flood of questions that are going to come in from our community is, you know, people talk about the child welfare system. I don't like the word ch child welfare because it acts as if we know what's best for rather than working on behalf of someone. But, uh, you know, this is this. This we have been looking at systems and what systems we should abolish and start all over. You know, and, be, and a lot of people, and, and I know Jessica, you've heard that, as well as Steve, you heard that. So I, I want to ask both of you because I think it's important that uh, we hear from someone who's worked in this area as things evolved, like you talked about, Dr. Price, as as it evolved and what it was for, and and how we've evolved and how we have to revolutionize to look at. Wow, if we just threw out the whole system and started over again. But then, Steve, I want you to talk about as you throw out that system, right, and start all over again, what, how do you start, right? Because I want to hear from someone who was in the system. And I read about and Steve talked about the time when he, um, you know, sometimes foster parents are in it for, quote, the money, uh, and they take a bunch of foster kids. And I remember him telling a story that he, I don't even remember, if Steve, if you remember this, you probably do, where he would want cereal. You could only have so much cereal. Mm -hmm. And his foster mother knew by the sound of how much cereal, by listening to the bowl, whether he was taking too much or not. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's the system we want to abolish and get rid of. Yeah. And yet I also know that there are foster parents who have become the parents, not foster, mm -hmm. of children, right? So so I'd like each of you to respond about if we were 20 years from now, how do you reimagine that system working on uh, behalf of children, Jessica? And Steve, what would you want that social worker to look like, okay? So if you would ask that and then we'll open it up for questions. Dr. Price, you want to start? Absolutely. So I think there was also a question in the chat about abolishing the child welfare system. So, so I'll start by saying that an abolitionist is a builder. 
And I know that people hear the word abolitionist and they get a little scared <laughs> and they say, all you want to do is tear down. But these people who are advocating for rebuilding our system are, by definition, you know, builders at heart. And I always want to talk about this analogy to give people some ease who are afraid of, you know, abolitionists. So I want to ask people, do they recall when Blockbuster had the fight with Netflix? And some people say, I don't think there was a fight. And I say, you're right. There was never a fight between Blockbuster and Netflix because Netflix, someone decided to build Netflix and it was better and it was more convenient and it had more financial benefits. And it was just all around a different way to engage in entertainment, entertainment movies. So all of a sudden we just didn't see any more blockbusters. You know, so I tell people don't fight and don't argue and don't go back and forth about abolishing the system, build. So that, that are my thoughts around, you know, you know, people that want to abolish child welfare. I know these people, they're my colleagues. I know they want to build something that is so better and work so differently that we look at this old system and we say, what was that? We, we, we separated families on a regular basis. No, we don't, we don't do that anymore. You know, so we we're reinvesting into communities. So if a family's in need, they go to their next door neighbor. We're making it harder for a neighbor to call CPS rather than help their neighbor. We want them to, you know, be more cohesive and more collaborative and cultivate that. I hope that helps a little. That's perfect. You know, Dr. Price, I, I, I and and I did my undergraduate work in political science, my graduate work in sociology, and uh, you know, day to day I'm in corporate America and in, immersed in the worlds of systems, structures, and the intersection of humanity, and how systems and structures impact people, dealing with age-old questions of agency and structure, which dominates. Um, and the, 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 even before we get to the question of abolishing any system. We need to first ask whether or not we have made the full on commitment to that system and to improving the lives, in this case, of young people. I don't think candidly that we can. And, you know, we're kind of past the stage of niceties here. Uh, and we ought to say unapologetically and unequivocally that America in particular has not fully invested uh, in uh, the child care system. It's not. And, and and when you see this cascading effect of income inequality, which is what we're seeing right now all across America, one of the places that that avalanche of in, in income inequality lands is on a family. Mm -hmm. So it's no accident that at the same time you're seeing this income inequality, you're seeing record levels of family separation, record levels of addiction, record levels of incarceration, and therefore a lack of support where so many of our leaders in all different facets of life saying, we're just gonna leave you to fend for yourself, in essence. That creates that generational impact. This is exactly what happened to my mother and father. It's exactly what happened to them. They weren't bad people, but by God, they had some bad things happen to them that they were not equipped to handle. And nobody thought, we, we've gotta help this 14 year old boy here who just lost his mother at the age of 40, who's wound up in a juvenile home because of it, we got to help him, but nobody helped Kenny Pemberton. And so he turns all that anger and frustration out upon the world, and it cost him his life, and it cost me a father. Same kind of thing is happening to my mother, who is being raised by a mother who's an alcoholic and suffering a mental health condition while her father's away at war. And as I'm reading my case, I can see the number of times my mother was saying, please, somebody help me. Please, somebody help me. But they were making character judgments about her, character judgments about her. And in her desperation, not equipped really to handle it, desperately saying, I just, I just want my children back. And, and so many, some well-intended, some less intended making judgments about her. You know, so I, I, I think that realizing the, the people behind these systems, our actions have a generational impact upon people. As for Mitt's question about what can a social worker do, and I can tell you what you can do in a quick story. My children started asking me, where were my mother and father? And it stunned me that they would be asking me that. I didn't realize that, you know, kids were thinking about that at six years old. I should have known better because I wanted to know where my mother and father were at that age. And pretty soon they, they bombarded me with so many questions. And I said, you know what, I've got to write this. I've got to get it down. Um, so they can have the questions to the answers, the answer to the questions that I never had. 
So I wrote a book about it. And as I'm doing my research, I called DSS, as it was called at the time, in Massachusetts and requested my case file. Uh, and it comes to me, and the first thing I remember was how big it was. And I remember looking, before I even opened it, and I said, boy, there's a lot more about my life than even I know. I'm flipping through it, and as I'm flipping through it, a picture comes tumbling out of the case file. And I look at it, and I said, oh, they mistakenly put the wrong child's photo in my case file. I have to return it. As I'm looking at it, and I'm like, wow, you know, this, this kid looks a little bit like my sons, Quinn and Vaughn. And that's all I'm thinking. I flip it over for any identifying information, and there I see my birth name, Steve Klakowitz. That picture was taken by a social worker when I was eight years old. It remains the only picture of me as a young boy. I have no other picture, actually. And when I saw that picture, all of a sudden I remembered everything about it. Who took it? A social worker, where I was, Buntonwood Park in New Bedford, what time of year it was, summer. Why would I remember that? I remembered it because it was the only time that anybody had deemed me important enough to take my picture. Mm. And I had kept that memory my whole life. The small things matter. The small things matter, like taking a child's photo that he's not going to see, which I would not see for another 40 years. But I had that memory of just that moment of goodness, that moment of kindness, that moment of just planting a seed. Oh, wow, Steve, thank you. Okay, let's let's get these questions rolling. Okay, Kathy Tillman, eventually, someday, maybe soon, can we please, please include a conversation about immigrant families who come into this highly flawed child welfare system? And yes, we will. We continuously leave this community members out of the conversation and they face so many complication issues that seem unimportant and invisible even to social workers. And Kathy, let me assure you, that uh, we're talking about all children. This has no boundaries right now, this conversation. We're talking about immigrant children too. The, the kids that we know that are have been separated from their families, the commitment to get them back to their families. So, so do know that this is not an issue where we can, we can think of kids just in the United States. Uh, good child welfare practices have to occur throughout our world. I mean, it, it's just like uh, Steve talked about, the, these systems interrelate uh, and are interconnected. So yes, we will think about a chat just specifically with immigrant children. And so uh, thank you for that reminder. Can we see another yeah, question? Go yeah, ahead, Steve, one, do you have a response? Uh, 15 second point here. Yeah, sure. well, we, we should point out that part of what the Biden administration has committed to is reunifying those families. That's important to note, you know, as well. And then the other thing that Dr. Price mentioned earlier is the Family First Prevention Act. And clearly that should be expanded to include the families that Kathy's talking about. Okay. Jessica, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, one thing I want to add is the importance of just trying to understand you know, the context from where these kids have come from and what they've been through. And again, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record, but no cookie cutter equality service models, mm -hmm. because what those kids have gone through and, you know, what these subjugated um, ethnic groups have gone through, we, we just don't understand as a social work profession. So I think the first step is going to really be to dig deep to understand, you know, what's happened to them and what they've seen and what they've gone through. Okay. And um, that's what I wanted to add. Yes, start with the people. Okay, so we have to answer this question because this is one of my old students, Emily Patterson. Disproportionately in our system is one of the biggest indicators that we are still a broken system. Disproportionality. And Jessica, I'll turn that one over to you. Sure, it doesn't sound like a question, um, but I will say, I will just comment on um, by saying that I agree. And I, I said earlier, we have to stop tolerating disproportionality and start working towards ameliorating it. Because you know, if you start to read the literature for decades and decades, this has been the case. This is nothing new. This did not start in May of 2020 when George Floyd was murdered. And I think it's important to know that we have to stop tolerating it and making it seem like this is just the way it has to be. 
Okay. Michelle Marie, teach harm reduction to all DCF workers, harm reduction. I think we'll agree on that one as well, right? Of course. Next question. Unless you all have something, Steve or Jessica, that you want to add to this. No, harm reduction is an extension of the Hippocratic Oath, right? Mm -hmm. do no harm, first do no harm. Um, and I and I think that that's 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 the north star that you always that you always come back to. It does require a longer you know longer view though of what of what we think sometimes that we're doing something for a child when we could actually be doing something to them. So Molly has this question for you, Dr. Price. Were you able to read that question? What organizations and efforts should be uplifting and throwing our energy in positionality and funding behind? Work around drug testing consent, abolition of state registries and shrinking definitions of neglect come to mind, but I would love to hear your thoughts. So what organizations and efforts should we be lift, uplifting and throwing energy behind? I am a huge proponent of making this pipeline from our system to schools. I know at least here in our state, you know, some of the major people that are calling in reports are educators. And I think we've used the term well-intentioned quite a bit. I think these people are well-intentioned. So I think having a clear connection and partnership with schools and CPS is really important. I also, you know, strongly believe that GAL, guardian ad litem organizations are hugely important, oh, but they also need, need a restructuring of their mindsets and training around equity. But I think it's important. I also think that GAL should be reimagined for parents as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a guardian ad litem, your whole purpose is the child. But I'm a big firm believer that we need to also have someone who's advocating on behalf of the parent. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps a little bit. Bill wants to know, some state legal some state legal systems has said that it's a violation of biological parents' right to a fair hearing when children are moved to a relative on an informal basis without legal intervention. How would you address that as social workers in the CPS system? And that goes back to guardian ad litems too. What you're, you're saying is that someone has to represent the interests of the parents. We should never have a hearing without that. Um, but what happens when sometimes we place a child with a sister or a brother? Right. And now we have the family worrying over these issues. I know you've run into that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can certainly speak to it. And I'll start by saying it goes back to that power differential. When I teach about power deconstruction, I talk about when we make decisions without parents being co-designers and co-conspirators, so to speak. You know, their reaction is often, you know, resistance and anger and feeling. And that's the underlying feeling of that is powerlessness. Mm -hmm. So I will say that when, when we place a child with an aunt or an uncle, you know, I want to ask, how did that decision come about? Did you make that decision? Did you wield all the power you have over this mom or over this dad and say, this is where the child is going? Or was it a community co-design? You know, did they have a say in this? Because if they didn't, you're right. It becomes very complex mm -hmm. and they begin to be doubly subjugated. I can't keep my child, but they can be three houses down with my sister and I had nothing to say about it. Mm -hmm. So we have to really you know, think about what that means for a biological parent. Again, relational ties are sacred and I believe in placing with other parents but, and other parts of the family. But it's also important to say, are we sharing power to co-design mm -hmm. this together? Okay, Richard, do you find value in the CASA programs or guardian ad litems in protecting a child's best interest in the foster care system and how can it be improved or better implemented? And again, you know, I dealt with guardian ad litems, but Jessica, you may know a little bit more about these two programs than I. Sure. So okay. I have talked to a lot of CASA programs over the last year, a lot of GAL, you know, these people are volunteers. They're coming into the system because they want to advocate for what's best for the child. About six months ago, I hosted a podcast and I got the opportunity to interview a youth in the system. Again, so moving, just like what you know, Mr. Pemberton is saying and hearing from someone who's in our system and talking about how it's been impacting them. One of the biggest, most profound things that this young lady said is that her GAL, you know, her CASA volunteer didn't listen to her. Mm -hmm. You know, they felt like they knew what was best for this child. So that's what I would say. I would say uh, one thing we can do to improve and better implement this volunteer organization is to make sure that they, too, are sharing power. Mm -hmm. Just because you're a volunteer doesn't mean you don't have power. 
right. you have power over what happens to that child. So it's going to be keenly important that you're listening to them. And Steve, I'm going to bring you back to a, a moment in your life when you were abused in your foster home and ended up in the hospital. And, um, you know, the social worker coming to see you and uh, the nurse that knew you were abused, but needed you to say that you were abused, right? You know, sometimes we try to force kids to say things knowing when we look in their eyes, they're struggling. How, how do you help protect a child who you know something is going wrong? What, what, what were you looking for? And, and kind of tell us about these human lighthouses. I know you coined these, some individuals in your life, especially the teacher that you ran and, and protected you um, because they believed in you. But you know, far too often, I, I find social workers are like, tell me what's going on to a young kid that if they told what was going on, they would be abused again. Um, can, you, can you speak to that? What what you need, Mitt, is someone really you can trust. And that was the biggest issue for me uh, was I, I didn't know who I could trust and I didn't know who I could confide in. And I don't ever remember anybody simply saying those words to me. You know, you can trust me. If there's anything happening here, you can let me know. And it was so it was more me relying and hoping that they would see without me saying anything because the foster home that I was in, to say something was to put me in great danger. Uh, and it ultimately uh, did put me in danger. In fact, uh, I still remember having to uh, complete the form, which will always be emblazoned upon my memory, the 51A, where I had to detail what was happening to me in that home. And then I had to go back to it. Mm. And uh, I still bear the scars of that experience. I mean, I managed to escape and, uh, and, and, and wound up um, uh, in, in one in a, in a wonderful situation, you know, as, as a result. But, you know, that's what I needed Mitt, was somebody who I could share this secret of what was happening to me, but not worry that it was going to, as the foster family promised me, mm -hmm. uh, they would, you know, kids like you die all the time and nobody asks any questions. So, you know, you be careful who you talk to. We know people in that department uh, and they had been successful in moving several social workers off my case. Uh, because of their connections and the awards that they had won. So even at a young age, eight, nine years old, I'm aware I'm up against one hell of a force here, an evil force. And I just, you know, so I needed something that I could see that could say, well, that is going to balance out, right? Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen until it was much later. In terms of the human lighthouses, uh, uh, and it's the next thing I'm writing about, and I'm writing about these people that I've met at different stages of my life. Um, uh, the neighbor who brought me books in that foster home. I'm writing about her. I'm writing uh, about um, uh, John Sykes, the teacher who took me in three days after Christmas when I literally had nowhere to go. My social worker, Mike Sylvia, called him in pure desperation. And I wound up staying with him uh, for my last year of high school. And, and there are others I am writing about who are equally powerful. I'll focus on John just for a minute for a couple of reasons. If you think about what a lighthouse is, there are 18,600 of them all across the world. As a technical matter, we don't really need lighthouses anymore. We have uh, global GPS and electronic navigation systems. We don't need a lighthouse to navigate the sea, but we do need as example to navigate humanity because the best attributes of the lighthouse are also the best attributes of humanity. The lighthouse is probably the most selfless structure that humankind has ever created. It serves no purpose other than to help guide the journey of the traveler. It is humble. It seeks no reward. It asks for no recognition. You cannot pay a lighthouse, actually. And the most powerful lighthouses in the world are the human ones. When John Sykes got that call three days after Christmas, he was the only one in his office. Uh, and I, I would ask him many years later, what was it like when you got that call? And he said, you know, he goes, I'm hearing the social worker in one ear, but I'm talking with God and having a conversation with God in the other ear. And he says, he says, I'm trying to convince God that I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Um, I'm a bachelor. I'm on my own. I can teach kids, but I can't, I can't raise this 15 year old boy. And I asked him, well, what did God say back to you? And he said, God, um, this boy, um, God said, John, this boy's out of options. And I know that you don't trust you, but I trust you and he needs you. I lost John about 
three weeks ago, and I'm still processing that loss. It's very hard because outside of Tanya and the kids, he was the next closest person in the world to me because he was there when no one, nobody else was. And so in, in John and I, John, I'm black, John's white, like Holly Davidson's and Jack Daniels and country music, I'm a city kid. But you can't, some in the words, describe how much I love that man and how much he meant to me, how profoundly I feel his loss. Uh, and yet he also instilled so many wonderful lessons in me too. And so our relationship was like this perf perfect marriage of, of this young boy who believes he deserves a chance in the world and this kind, caring adult who helped him realize it. And that's what any of us can do in any single moment. And it changes everything. It changes quite literally everything. Wow. I want to thank you for sharing that. I also want you to know how much I, you are in my thoughts and prayers because I know how much he meant to you. Um, and I have to tell you to remember that proverb you spoke about, he, mm -hmm. that shade, you're sitting under it. And John's thankful that he planted that tree. So yeah. to just remember that. Um, wow. You know, that this is why we wanted to have these chats with Mitt because we, we, we know that there, we, we start where people are. And, and we started with Steve as a young boy who, who came into care at the age of three, um, separated from his brothers and sisters and didn't know it. And, and yet today, he has, he, the world is his oyster, but there's still that pain um, that we feel. And so uh, you, the human lighthouse, you, the social worker, you know, uh, and Jessica, I'm going to turn this question over to you. We constantly have to go and perfect our skills, right? You know, um, what you may have learned in school may no longer be applicable to where we are as a society. And that's why when we talk about abolitionists, we're all abolitionists. Every social worker should be an abolitionist. We should try to be working ourselves out of a job, should we not? Um, that's the power that we have. So, so Jessica, I just wanted to see if you'd like to respond um, to, 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 again, we're asking the question to those who are listening to us today. What are you going to do today? Not tomorrow. Not putting your fingers and saying the system needs to change. If you want to change that system, if you want to revolutionize it, if you want to obliterate it, how are you going to do it, right? So what could people do today? What do you tell people? And I've watched you on TED Talks. I mean, you know, you've got to, you've got to Google both of these people. You know, their, their bios don't even, you know, just Google Steve Pemberton. Google Jessica Price, and you will be able to have your own course, um, and it will last for a while. So, Jessica, what what do you say to this new social worker like me? Okay, take from me. Now, I'm, I'm in my golden age, but I entered working in the social welfare system in my 20s. I had no kids, right? Um, and I was in charge of someone's life, of whether they were going to come in, stay out, what I was going to do. Um, talk to a young Mitt Joyner. So I, I think I'm supposed to respond to you and the question that was just up. Awesome. So I, I know that the question said, how do we discuss disparities and how to fix it? So I, I won't keep you all here till about 9 p.m., but I will try my best to, you know, address this. The first thing I'm going to say, um, Ms. Collins, is something that might people might not think I'm, you know, we're ready for this, but I don't know if anyone read about a week ago, the APA, the American Psychological Association, they released a public statement apologizing for perpetuating systemic racism through psychiatry. And I tell people often when they ask this question, how do we begin to fix racial disparities in child welfare? I tell them we need to acknowledge what we've done as a system. And that hasn't happened yet. So I think the first step to, as you your question says, remedying, you know, how do we fix this problem? is talking about what we've done. We teach our kids that changed behavior needs to come after apology. But child welfare, what we've been talking about for the last 10 months cohesively is how do we change our system? So we're trying to change our child welfare behavior, are we not? But no one has talked about that apology, that idea of reconciliation, going to the people that have been harmed and saying, 
we may have been well-intentioned, but we've separated families without really thinking comprehensively how to keep you together. We didn't ask who already loves this child. We didn't think about the trauma of sitting in foster care for six plus years for a black youth that are already at multiple intersections of inequity before they leave their home. So I, I think that that's one of the biggest steps we can take. I tell social workers, I say, it's not going to be easy for child welfare, for the social work profession to say, we've gone about this the wrong way, but tomorrow's a new day. So that's what I believe is the first step to trying to fix the system, acknowledging that we, although well-intentioned, have caused harm, but we're going to, again, plant a tree today. Yes, you know, that, that apology, uh, being in South Africa, the truth and reconciliation process, and to see mothers who wanted to know what happened to their child when they were dying. They just wanted to hear and have that apology. And, and social workers need to understand we have to apologize uh, for things that we do. We're going to bring Angelo McLean on in a few minutes because we're looking at that in NASW. Um, you know, we, we, we've got to do that. We can't move forward unless we do the truth and reconciliation. So while we're going to be waiting for Angelo, let's, let's look at this question from Ms. Atkins. What thoughts does the panel have about helping youth that are in residential care, especially those that are older and families are not looking to adopt? Um, and and that, that, that is a question that we have to think about. So what, what do we do to help the youth in residential care, you know, the, the ones that are aging out. And, and we're going to try to do a follow-up show with, with some people who've worked in that system and, and try to help Hunter Keaton. And you you know Hunter um, Beaton, uh, who's, who buys, literally, he has a foundation so that no kid has to move in a paper bag. You know how kids have to move in garbage bags, that, that kind of thing. So we're going to bring Hunter on talking about it. Tiffany Lane, who who creates packages for kids who are aging out. But aging out is is rough, you know. So what do you have to say to them? And we'll start with you, Steve, and then circle to you. Uh, and thanks, Angelo, for joining us. He didn't know that he was going to have to do this today, but we're going to bring him on anyway. Right. Right. <laughs> go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, man, man, I, I, I'd say having been exactly through that 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 experience, Ms. Atkins, I, I, I completely understand the question that 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 you're getting at. Um, that's a beautiful family photo, by the way, I, I, I see. Um, I think it's as much about at that point about skills in, in particular. How can we help you develop the skills that will allow you uh, to move um, into um, a meaningful uh, life? One of the things I did during my time at Walgreens when I was a uh, uh, corporate executive there is I created internship programs in New York City working with local agencies for kids specifically who are aging out so they can be introduced to the world of work. I think we need to look at extending care. So we're talking about policy uh, over the course of, of this conversation. And I think we need to extend that out until you're 21. Uh, so if you've been through multiple placements, you're not all of a sudden cast off into society and we can begin to, to literally buy the time that we need to get you to 21 to increase your skill development and allow you to realize some of the dreams and aspirations that we know you already have. Uh, for me, fortunately, I had a college acceptance letter. That's how I knew where I was going to be when I aged out. But only, I think, 1% of those of us who age out actually do. So we're going to need a different kind of structure and expansion and an improvement of the existing system, especially for those who we know are entering uh, the aging out um, a portal, uh, for lack of a better term, in, in record numbers. Okay, thank you. Jessica. So I can start by saying that I do think we should put our best foot forward to, you know, try to make sure kids that we have deemed unsafe and we've exhausted any type of kinship placements, that they're placed in a foster home in a family environment. I do know some kids have to go into residential group care. So I will talk about a project that we're doing here at the Florida Institute for Child Welfare. We're going into our fifth year of really trying to institute quality standards in residential group care for our kids here in Florida. For years, you know, group homes got to be licensed and they had to, you know, really check some boxes off 
but now it's going to be a much, a very different process. Uh, we're really revolutionizing. Can you open up a group home? Things like certain therapists that are on site and, and a, a registered nurse on site and, and different types of collaborations in the system to make sure that if you go into a group home here in Florida, it's going to be a, a very different experience for you. So I would say, A, try not to use you know, residential group care. And if you have to just make certain there are some quality standards in place here in Florida, we are creating that quality standards process to be a part of their licensure journey. So they can't do one without the other. Thank you. Um, Angelo, would you want to take a stab at that question before I do? Um, you're going to have to repeat the question that I was sitting here thinking about uh, how much I appreciate Steve's testimony and how much I appreciate, uh, you know, I've heard Steve's story at least a half dozen times and every time I, I, I learned something and then I was sitting here thinking about uh, how much I appreciate Jessica using her skills, her macro skills for as an educator, a, a researcher and an advocate uh, for, you know, really challenging the system. And, uh, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is that, uh, you know, I, I was started my career in child welfare as a an ongoing worker and a, a an a investigator of 51 A's, as, as Steve says, and uh, and then I finished my child welfare career as a as a commissioner uh, in Massachusetts, and uh, and I know when I came in as commissioner, folks were saying, well, a lot of these these problems are intractable. There's nothing you can do about them, mm -hmm. but you know we actually did a lot uh, to change those so-called intractable uh, issues. And I just I just appreciate the testimony of Steve and Jessica of really telling our listeners and folks who who hear the recording as well that that you know change is possible and we can make these changes and 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 just that how important you never know a smile a pat on the back a kind word you know expression of caring and that can go such a long long way in in, in a kid's life. Okay, thank you. Uh, I I tend to agree. Um, I um, wanted to thank you for having the, uh, having the platform and being the CEO and allowing us to, to all come together. So we'll circle back. All right, um, can we come on back, all of us on screen and um, really focus? You know, the one thing that I wanna say is something that you said, Steve, and something that Jessica said and Angelo, it's connections too. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to let go. I'm one of those people that once you're in the world, once you're in Mitt's world, you are in it forever. And that's true. You know, I mean, the same way with Jessica, I've never really met Jessica personally, but I knew somebody that knew her and she's been in my world. I email her in the middle of the night, the same with Steve, but I, and Angelo, one thing I have to say is some of my students that I had when I was at Westchester University, some of them had aged out and were in the university. And, and again, the, the life that they had to navigate uh, of even being able to stay in the university was difficult. And I remember one student of mine um, who, who struggled to just struggle to, to stay in school, smart, 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 got pregnant in her senior year um, and thought she was going to circle back and you know someone was going to take her child away and and you know those those things that you try to do is to get that individual the assistance so that she was able to complete well today i got an email that this young woman who uh you know was in love with someone who ended up in in prison but she had a love and, and she stayed with them. They had children together. They didn't get married. Um, she believed in him and she kind of explained it to me one time. It's your circumstances that keep you, you know, you don't know what it's like to live where I live and the things that you have to navigate. And so stick with me. Well, she sent me a picture of a brand new home that her and her husband built for their three children. And I think if you just let people know that they have possibilities, right? Um, and, and, and the thing of aging out, how do you age out of a foster home, right? Your child never ages out. I have 30-year-old, 31-year-old, 35-year-old kids, and they call me today when they're in crisis. We've got to create something so that people can be connected. Because in order for this world to be that better human place, that workforce that you're working on, Steve, is to let people know 
that they're full of possibilities. So um, I want to take this time and allow each of you to sum up because we have, a, you know, going under time. Uh, I we, We're going to have your questions to all of you all that have uh, joined Essential Chats with Mitt. I appreciate it. Um, and, and just sum up your thoughts and then I, I'll take it out. Thank you, Ty. There's Ty. You know, Ty is somebody that we love, Steve, um, just telling us to keep on doing what we're doing, right? Um, Angelo, do you want to start and, and, and sum up what you saw? You, you represent this, right? This is NASW, and this yeah. is the connection yeah. that we wanted to make. And um, so... Yeah, I can I, I can jump in and start it. Uh, I was and Steve was talking about you know loss of, of folks who are important in his life. You now I spent five years in a, in a residential group home in, in Texas uh, with some adults. In my life were important. You know, wearing the cowboy boots and the cowboy hats, and uh, you know they're they're in their eighties or, or and we're losing some of them. So Steve, I'm 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 going through that myself of and just really appreciating and 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 they know that if the shoe were reversed. I would have done the same thing for them. I would have, you know, listened to the other ear of God saying, you got to step up, you got to do this. And uh, so, and, the, and I know the, 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 the biggest thank you I can give them is, is making a success of myself. And, uh, and, and, and you've done that in spades and just, I'm just so proud of your, of your testimony. You know, the aging out, I remember uh, my daughter one day in, uh, and I was commissioner while she was in that sort of, you know, 16 to 22 age. And she looked at me one day, she says, dad, how do the foster kids make it? You know, how do they make it? She says, I'm going to need your support. I'm 26, 27, 28. Um, and, and that was true. She did. But, um, and I was fortunate to be in Massachusetts where, you know, we had kids who'd stay in the system until they were 21. And actually I checked one day and we had 20, we had a hundred 25 year olds in the system. So we would, as long as, as much as we can stretch it, I'd say if, in every state across the country, make sure that you've got legislation that allows kids to stay in until they're, they're 21, 22, because they need that support. And I talked to so many foster kids who would say, the, the most help I got from the department was after I turned 18, because that emotional support that you gave me, because you could have let me go then, it has lasted me a lifetime. And it, it's just so important to be, you know, we care. We, we, we care so much that we're going to not drop you at the first opportunity that we can we're gonna we're gonna stay in there and and we've made a lot of investment in you and, and we know you can that not only can you make something yourself it, it, you are something and i it, you know the story that steve talks about when he met his uh his other side of his family he hadn't met and uh and that they said something dis disparaging about his mom and dad and and he says you know you know, I am, they did do some good because here I am standing right here in front of you. Mm. And, uh, and that's what we want to impart in all, of our, in all of our kids. Thank you, Angelo. And thank you for sharing your experience as well. Jessica? Yeah, so my summation would be, um, I want to thank you all for having me on the panel. Mr. Pemberton, I really appreciate you sharing your, your story. And it, it motivates me even more to want to rebuild our system because I want a system where social workers can mimic the social workers that really impacted your life. And right now, our system in so many ways, whether it's paperwork, whether it's bureaucracy, whether it's overloading with caseloads, you know, it's hard to connect with families and it's hard to do the work that our social workers want to do. So I do want to continue to rebuild child welfare so that the people that come into the field have the freedom, professional freedom, to connect with a child on that level and do what they were able to do for you. You'll be a great one there, Jessica. I know that. <laughs> Steve, my friend Steve. Yeah, I, I echo uh, both Angelo. Angelo, good to see you again, um, and Dr. Price's, uh, you know, thoughts and, and comments. I, you know, I will say that we've learned quite a few things over the last few years. Just how fragile life is, uh, how fragile relationships are, how fragile systems are. This, these are the times in which we're living. How fragile families are. Uh, yet uh, the, the history of this country is that we often know when we have to self-correct, when we have to pivot. Uh, and we have done that, but every 60 years or so, actually, 
and this is a time of extraordinary pivoting actually where we're going to have this have this greater alignment between our systems and our structures and and humanity because this other option this other choice so the path that we've been on that's been accelerated by a pandemic is uh is leads to no to really no no good end you know i, I would just say for those of you uh and i see all the wonderful comments in, in the chat and again thanks for the brainchild of putting all this together uh i would only say just from my own you know view and lens is that um you know cycles can end actually they do end i am evidence of it and and i hope what you see in me is not an exception i'm not an exception nor can you ever convince me that i'm exceptional i'm not an exception i'm actually a reflection of what happens when the village shows up to surround the life of a child who has found themselves in the gaps of a system that they did not ask for and that they did not create but they have the strength and the resilience and the grit and the determination to try and build a, a new chapter you know there's not a day passes that i it doesn't cross my mind in some way shape or form that my children know very little in the way of experience about the journey that i've had and isn't that how it should be that's mm -hmm. exactly how it should be that a cycle actually you know can end and then lastly though the work is heavy at times and weighty never underestimate the power and the impact that you're having on uh, on a life it, it can show up later and sometimes it might not show up uh, at, at all but I'm an example of how the story turns out, actually. I, I'm, I'm evidence of all of the good work that you do. And even the times that it, it, you do question quiet and quiet of your own heart. Am I having an impact here? Am I changing a life? Well, <laughs> I'm your answer. You absolutely are. Thank you. So uh, in closing, to all of you, our audience, I just want you to know now you understand why I listened to Frankie Beverly this morning because these are the golden days, right? Each of you have that one golden chance to improve and make sure that kids in our communities are taken care of and that they grow into the adults that they can be and that their light be able to shine. I mean, I came into this profession to make a difference, not to make people the way that I wanted them to be, but to help people become who they want to become. So we asked all of you today to A, think about it, and then write down, I'm going to ask you to do something that I was told to do at Howard University, Jessica, is to write down something that you will do. Uh, you will do to change the system. Put it up on your wall. And when you do it, pull it down, but then write another thing. And then in a few years, you're going to be president of NASW. And you're going to have your own essential chat. And you will be able to say to people that you can make a difference one step at a time. So I thank you all for joining us. I ask you to stick with this series. Again, I am humbled. I appreciate all three of you, Angelo, for taking time out of your busy schedule, Jessica, for doing what you need to do. I know you could be a million places. And Steve, I mean, Steve, Steve, Steve is asked to be all over, right? Um, he, he's been there with the Obamas. He's been there with Oprah Winfrey. And he's come to Mitt Joyner, right? So uh, I, I, feel, I feel privileged and honored to know that they, you all were my first essential chat. Uh, and because of you, I know all of you understand what your membership to NASW brings. We need more of you to make impact on that system. Remember that there's only seven states that require social workers to have a degree to work in child welfare. That's something that we need to get changed. Uh, so I thank you all and have a good, good evening. Bye, and I thank Greg and Aaliyah. Bye-bye. <laughs>